Hello, everybody. Whether you guys are uh, watching live or catching our talks at your convenience, thank you so much for tuning in. If we haven't met before, I'm Andy Giordano, and I'm the board president here at Headwaters Science Institute. I hope you guys have found this fall speaker series focusing on women in science as inspiring as I have. Tonight, we are bringing you the last of our five speakers, Tucker Malarkey, author of Stronghold, One Man's Journey to Save the World's Wild Salmon. But before we bring Tucker in, we've got some Headwaters-related housekeeping for you guys. Uh, I can't tell you how proud I am of how Headwaters has faced the challenges uh, that COVID presented education and educators over the past six months. And I wanna highlight two of our programs. First are free online lessons that give you the opportunity to keep your kids engaged in hands-on science using our student-driven methods. You can find these lessons by visiting our website at headwaterscience.org, or sorry, headwaterscienceinstitute.org, or by following us on Facebook. Secondly, on the heels of our successful online summer camps, we've pivoted our fall camps for student research online as well, making them more accessible to all students. So if you're looking for an authentic learning experience, that extends beyond whatever school offerings you guys have this fall, please check out our camps by visiting headwaterscienceinstitute.org. Uh, we are really happy to continue building our scholarship offerings for these camps as well. So, you know, in the face of all the challenges that COVID brings, we know that science education matters more than ever, and making informed decisions as a scientist continues to be of paramount importance. And we're excited to keep building student confidence and their ability to do just these things. So if you'd like to get involved by donating to Headwaters, keeping our online programming free and widely available, please check out headwaterscienceinstitute.org backslash donate. So that's all the housekeeping. I'm excited to bring in our final speaker of the Women in Science series, Tucker Malarkey. Tucker is the author of the critically acclaimed and nationally best-selling novels, An Obvious Enchantment and Resurrection. Stronghold, her first major work of nonfiction, describes one man's journey to save salmon habitat in the US and Russia. Due out in paperback in October of this year, Stronghold was an editor's pick for the New York Times, National Book Review, Outside Magazine, and Forbes. With a career that began at the Washington Post, Tucker's love of human culture and wilderness have since taken her all over the world. She lives in Berkeley, California. Welcome, Tucker. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, so we were introduced by a mutual friend um, after he gave me your book, Stronghold, back in March. Um, I read the book and it took a month to sort of think about it. And then I, I wanted to reach out to you and see about your interest in speaking in this series for Headwaters. So I'm curious what you think the messages are um, that you think overlap between what we do at Headwaters and the story that you're telling in Stronghold. Yeah, um, I, I saw a natural fit with Headwaters as soon as I started looking um, at what you guys do, which is just incredible because um, really Stronghold is about um, a young boy's discovery of the field and um, self-propelled uh, science and intense curiosity and the directness of interacting with the environment and how that kind of learning is so impactful, so much more impactful than being told something, you know? And so I thought it was, I was very happy to oblige because I'm a big supporter of your mission. That's fantastic. Um, you know, I wonder, one of the things we've been talking about is this um, this concept of storytelling in science and and how storytellers and and the, this idea of telling stories brings so many more people into scientific understanding. And I wonder what you think. Like, why aren't facts and findings? Why why isn't the data good enough for us? Why do we need storytellers? It's so funny, isn't it? Um, I find myself now wrapped up another very even more scientific story and um i think it's i've been i've been uh, reading a bit about the brain about the the left and right hemisphere hemispheres and and i think that the left hemisphere which um 
is dominant in science, is very good at um, reducing things, making equations, making kind of closed systems that can be predictable and forecasting and um, data and models and um, control, basically. Uh, the right side is more intuitive and thinks in terms of stories and metaphors and relationships and inclusion. And I think that the right hemisphere people have been a little nudged out in the science world, um, you know, to ill effect because I think that there are so many amazing stories within science that they need translating. And I saw, I had to do a lot of translating with this book um, because different specialties have become so specialized that they can only understand each other. And a lot of precious, precious information gets lost um, because we don't understand the vocabulary. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Uh, well, I'm excited to hear you translate this story for us. <laughs> Um, so we're going to hand it over to Tucker. She's going to do a presentation and read a little bit from the book Stronghold. Afterwards, we'll have plenty of time for questions. So if you do have questions, please throw them into the Facebook comments throughout the presentation and we'll get to them near the end. All right. Sorry, Andy, do you see my full my slide yet? Or... Yeah. And I'm going to back out. Oh, no, we lost it. Okay. 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 We got it. Sorry, folks, this is the ongoing challenge. Got it? Got it. Okay. So Andy had mentioned that this, this is actually the, um, first of all, thank you for having me. And I'm not sure how I slipped into this group because I'm decidedly not a um, STEM person, but maybe I am after all. <laughs> um, more on that in a minute. Um, this is the paperback of Stronghold that is now not due out in October because supply chains have been dis so disrupted by COVID. So it, it's been bumped to February. In any case, so yes, um, I wrote Stronghold because I saw an irresistible story about a, a man um, and an ecosystem, basically, and both were just wildly interesting and they intertwined. And I thought, my God, you know, if I could tell this story, it might be interesting to people and it might change them a bit like it changed me. Um, so it's a very personal story and a very it, human story. And I think that that's why it's broken out of sort of the conservation um, boundaries a bit um, or environmental studies boundaries because it's, uh, it weaves a few layers together and it follows um, my first cousin, Guido Rar. Um, and really the story starts at our fishing cabins in um, Oregon, out in the wilds there in the high desert on the Deschutes River, uh, where we went as children um, and spent many summers. And I was the younger cousin to Guido, um, who I knew was different. Um, he had a preternatural comfort with wild creatures and had little to no interest in people at all or their systems. And um, he was badly dyslexic, fell through the cracks at school, but he was busy, um, you know, kind of creating his own education by being out in the wilds every moment he could be. And he was what they call a herp, you know, a guy who, or a gal, who's interested in reptiles, so snakes and lizards and such. And he found them fascinating and beautiful. And he studied them endlessly uh, and learned to cap capture them. Um, for Guido, capturing was the indication that he had understood the creature and its habitat well enough to be able to predict where it would be. And he caught all kinds of creatures, which he took back to his room, sketched, studied, and then released back into the wild. And um, 
you know, he seemed to me to have special powers. I still believe this about him. And at one point he told me that he saw the world from above, like 30,000 feet up. And I thought, gosh, you know, I think that makes sense because he seemed to understand the stories of the land and had a deeper understanding than most of us humans of um, how ecosystems work. So yeah, he could find all these creatures um, that lived in our in our habitat um, on the Deschutes River. He didn't care if they were venomous or not. It's a diamondback rattlesnake, yeah, which he would have no problem catching. And even living with. Um, here he is in high school with a mountain king snake. Uh, he he campaigned to go to Arizona to school because it was the prime prime habitat for the snake that he was obsessed with. And um, he didn't end up getting a diploma because he spent so much time out in the wilds looking for this snake. Um, yeah, so he was unapologetically different from most kids. And when he did end up going to college, he brought um, two rattlesnakes, two mountain king snakes, a 13 foot reticulated Burmese python named Monty and kept them all in his dorm room. Um, and when in spring, when it started getting warmer and the snakes started, you know, come, coming active again, the rattlesnakes would be rattling and he would turn his music up to drown them out. And he saw nothing strange or wrong with this. <laughs> so when he was a teenager, he discovered um, his ultimate quarry um, uh, through, this, through the sport of fly fishing. Um, and this was an exponentially more complex hunt for him because it involved the mysteries of fish and fish live in water and there's only so much we can know about them. But he studied them patiently, obsessively, uh, studied their habitat, what they ate, when they ate, um, what happened to them at different times of the year, at different times of the day. And um, he mastered this sport of fly fishing. And it, for those of you who don't know anything about fly fishing, it is a very difficult, if not maddening, um, operation. And I spent many years as a child very frustrated by it. But um, you'll see, here's some dry flies for you. You'll see how small these hooks are and they, the, the fly fishermen, um, they squeeze the barb out because they respect the fish so much they don't want to tear tear the the mouth um, of the fish when when they're caught. They want it to release the fish usually so they can easily slip the the hook out. But these are flies that Guido all tied, you know, on his own with with you know moose, elk, deer, rabbits, you know, uh, peacock and. Uh, pheasant and and they're supposed to imitate a fly that is actually hatching above the river and um, the idea is to cast your fly your line so perfectly that the fly just lands on the river as if it's a an actual fly and so you're kind of tricking the fish but it's a very respectable way to to catch one of these creatures because you really are meeting it on its own ground. And this appealed to Guido for obvious reasons. Um, so he soon graduated from the trout in our river to steelhead, which are the sea run version of trout. Some would say these fish are salmon, but they're much bigger, much wilier and harder to catch. And then he decided to try for Pacific salmon on a fly, which no one was doing at that time. Um, no one thought that such a delicate uh, setup as um, a fly fishing rod and these little, you know, flies would be successful in landing these large fish. And Guido thought, why not? Um, which is always how he thinks. And uh, he doesn't take anyone's word for anything. And sure enough, he was able to catch these 
huge fish and um, he started traveling all up and down the Pacific Northwest and up to Alaska um, in search of bigger and bigger fish. And uh, he wasn't just good at this, um, he was great. And soon he started um, holding world records for the biggest fish caught on a fly. Um, and in the meantime, he fell in love with these tremendous creatures who have uh, such a fascinating life history. A life history is how you describe the, uh, you know, the life of, 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 of a fish, you know, what they do in their life and uh, in, in their lifetime. And um, there he is in the back of his pram, like a scientist, you know, trying to tweak and figure out exactly what uh, to throw out there on the river for that particular day. So I want to talk for a minute about Pacific salmon because they are remarkable. Um, they started as a freshwater fish, and it was when the ice caps melted that they sensed um, a bigger food supply out in the ocean. And that is what drives these fish. They want to get big and strong and they want to have more eggs. They basically, you know, they want to, it's sort of the version of fame and fortune for a salmon is to have lots and lots of eggs. So the bigger the fish is, the more eggs it lays. Um, so over tens or millions of thousands, tens of thousands or millions of years, these fish um, adapted to uh, process salt water. So they basically, um, they're born in the river and when it's time for them to go to the ocean, they start to transform their kidneys and their lungs to process this, this, new, this new medium. And then they just tip off the estuary or the, into the ocean and they disappear. They disappear for different periods of time. Um, and let me just introduce quickly this, this map, which is represents um, the salmon ecosystem, the Pacific salmon ecosystem. And this isn't a map you often see. It's generally bisected. We see, you know, our piece over here and Russia and Asia usually aren't connected. But these, but Pacific salmon, this is their habitat. And our, our fish over here in um, Washington and Oregon, British Columbia, they'll swim all the way over here to these cold, clear, clean seas, which are incredibly bioprotective. And they will feed and they will stay for, you know, years until it's time for them to head back not just to any river, but back to their home river, to the river they were born in, which is one of the many mysteries of these fish. And there are theories about how they do that. Um, some say they navigate by the moon and stars. Some say they have some sort of magnetic alignment. Some say they can sense a drop of their and that they can drift on the current and follow that scent all the way back home again. But it makes them remarkable um, because they are, in fact, these nutrient bombs. Um, and so many creatures feed on them. And so they supply food um, you know, across this vast, vast area. Uh, so these are the species. There's one species missing. There are six species of um, Pacific salmon. There's the one that's missing is an Asian species called Masu, and it's missing because we don't really see it over here. But here you have juvenile. This is the juvenile um, Chinook, and this is the Chinook when it's out in the ocean, and this is the Chinook when it comes back into the river to spawn. And this is, you can sort of trace how, how these fish change so dramatically in their lifetime. And what's incredible about them is that they all occupy different places in the ecosystem. So they spawn in different places, meaning they have their, you know, they lay their eggs in different parts of the river with different size gravel. 
some prefer calm water, some prefer um, fast water. Uh, when they go out to the ocean, they go to different parts of the ocean, they eat different food, they stay out for different periods of time. So it's quite something because they represent sort of a mosaic. Um, and if you, you know, this is a salmon river, you, you know, different, different species would be finding their home in different parts of this river. So they aren't in fact competing for the same resources, they're complements. The reason this is so important is um, because this genetic diversity has been the reason for the ongoing abundance of Pacific salmon. So, you know, in the environment where no two years are the same, um, one year that has lots of rain will favor one species that perhaps has farther to swim upriver. You know, some of the bigger fish um, swim, you know, a thousand miles inland. Um, you know, in a drought year, that might be tough because the river might might dry up and, and then the species, the pink and chum salmon that spawn just inside um, the mouth of the river would be favored. But in fact, um, some fish would always survive. Um, and uh, so um, I was just gonna add something that the fish get as big as they need to um, in order to get home. So it's sort of like gas in the tank, a Chinook salmon, a big Chinook salmon that has a long way to travel, a long journey will, will pack on a lot of muscle and fat because it, it has a long way, a long way to travel. And, um, and then, you know, it has, it has um, the integrity of its meat is greater. You pay more for these in the marketplace, these fish that, that travel farther because they taste better and they have more fat. Um, so, the reason I think that Sam would, salmon would probably adapt fully to the ocean if they didn't have these fragile, pearly eggs um, that I'm sure you've seen in sushi bars uh, that wouldn't survive a moment in the Pacific. So that's why they have to go all the way back um, to their birthplace. And sadly, they can't make the reverse transformation um, and really, as soon as they hit that fresh water, they start to slowly die. So um, it's strange that, you know, at the peak of their lives, um, you know, these beautiful spawning colors, these are for mating purposes to attract attention. Um, at the peak of their sexual maturity in their lives, they really are very close to death. So after spawning, they, um, they expire and uh, die within days or weeks. So um, imagine these fish, hundreds of thousands or millions of them coming into these rivers in the Pacific Northwest and dying. And um, imagine what a nutrient download that is for these riparian areas. Um, it is these, each one of these fish, like you buy these omegas in the store, they are filled with, you know, superfood. So this is the distribution, the salmon distribution um, in the Pacific Rim, and it's green for a reason. Um, and that is because everything in the salmon ecosystem is incredibly productive. So, you know, outside of all the species that feed on salmon, when the salmon die and, are, and decompose into the soil, everything from a microbial level um, feeds and is nourished by, by salmon nutrients. Um, it's quite remarkable. Everything in a salmon ecosystem is bigger than its counterpart somewhere else. You know, the eagles, the bears, the wolves, and the trees. Um, actually, in it, it was part of, um, Guido's, uh, one of Guido's research projects over in Russia that um, confirmed that even the trees um, 
are built on are basically built on salmon. You can cut open a, a thousand year old old growth tree and find n nitrogen isotopes um, that are unique to marine systems. So even these beautiful old forests um, are built on salmon. So they're quite remarkable, and they really cycle, you know, back and forth through these these waters and and so it is it is an incredible healthy ecosystem that is regenerative um i just wanted to show you um you know the a detail of the kind of circulatory system of this region which is amazing because this is what most of our earth looks like a lot of it is covered by concrete now but there are it almost looks like a human circulatory system with veins and arteries and capillaries and water is just so important um, in our world and it's always there. And so uh, really salmon move like uh, red blood cells through these systems back out into the ocean where they pile on the nutrients and they go back to the rivers and die and the whole cycle starts over again. So these, so salmon, 137 species rely on salmon. They are what's called a keystone species without which, and you might've heard some of these stories um, in, the, in the news in the past few years because some um, salmon runs are declining and um, these animals are, are also um, in trouble because of that decline. But yeah, these are some of the apex predators that, that feed on salmon. So, um, so Guido understood all about this in his own way. He had um, done his own research and had been watching closely and um, was shocked but not surprised when in 1991, the first survey, um, the first analysis of, of um, um, Pacific salmon populations was published and show, showed that um, salmon runs throughout the Pacific North, Northwest were in precipitous decline. Um, a run of 30,000 fish, you know, over a couple of decades had gone to, you know, um, from 30,000 to 3,000. I mean, the numbers were horrific and uh, really his life changed in that moment and he knew that he was somebody who could affect the outcome simply because of the depth of his understanding of the habitat and the behavior of these fish. He did not, however, um, he wasn't in a position uh, to do much, but he, um, he, uh, he had put together the pieces of why it had happened. And um, so salmon need three things to survive. And one, the first is access to their rivers. And so dams and culverts that had gone up without thought to fish ladders and, you know, um, passages for salmon um, had really taken their toll. Um, and then there was clear cutting. So trees are incredibly important to salmon um, and to salmon habitat. They offer the banks of the river um, real stability um, with their root systems. And when they die and fall in the river, they also provide incredible habitat for young salmon. And most importantly, they provide shade, which keeps the river cool enough. And um, a cool, cold river is an oxygenated river. And um, when a river warms up, a fish is starved of oxygen, starved of oxygen. So this clear cutting um, was a real problem. And again, it was lack of understanding. Like he, Guido had seen all these things happening, but it seemed that you know nobody was putting the pieces together. The third piece was agriculture. Now forgive the wording here. I just had to use this slide anyway, because it showed, <laughs> Um, what can happen to a river um, that is so compromised by agriculture that it's just given up on, right? Those are trees, not water. 
but the pesticides and the di diversions um, really compromise rivers. Um, you know, they just go right up next to the river. And, you know, even if there was a little bit of a boundary, it would, it would make a difference. But again, there seemed to be a pretty high level of ignorance about what these fish needed and ignorance about how important they were. So Guido um, settled on, so he settled on his own conservation strategy. Um, he watched as sort of billions of dollars were thrown into conservation and protection and restoration of salmon rivers to little to no effect. Um, it's very hard to bring back a salmon river once the salmon start to disappear. Uh, it will never be what it once was. It's like Humpty Dumpty. You can't really put the pieces back together again. So he saw um, tremendous value in protecting the uh, salmon strongholds, the perfect salmon rivers that, that, that were still um, healthy and, and existed across the Pacific Rim. And he latched on to this idea um, and thought it was a, a, you know, the best possible way to protect these fish um, while uh, ignorant, ignorance waned and consciousness grew about um, how important they were. So um, yeah, this is a, a salmon stronghold here. Uh, so he, um, like I said, he uh, he didn't have much of a platform, and he realized this, and he realized that he needed people to help him with this mission, and um, and beyond that, he needed school. He needed to go back to school, which was a bitter pill that he resolved to swallow, and he looked out at the programs, um, and he chose the oldest and the finest, um, the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, and he thought, no, that's the one for me. And um, at the same time, probably in his mind was a uh, memory of his um, college performance, which wasn't stellar. So he decided to get in his car and drive to New Haven, to Yale, to talk to the admissions professors and um, those who would be involved in, in evaluating incoming students. And, um, and he presented his case and they were all uh, incredibly impressed by his knowledge and his expertise and his profound understanding of ecosystems. Um, and they said, you're an ideal candidate, please apply. And so he did apply and had his transcript from University of Oregon sent on. And um, a few weeks later, I hear, heard back from Yale. Um, and they said, you know, these are the worst transcripts we've ever seen. Um, we can't let you in. So Guido, he was, he was uh, upset. But the thing about Guido is that he never takes no for an answer. No is never no. No is like, oh, I have to try something else which is a brilliant strategy in life, by the way. Um, so he said, okay, well, what do I need to do to become competitive next year? And they said, well, walk your talk, you know, do something incredible and come back to us. And so he did just that. He went down to the Amazon and joined the Rainforest Forest Alliance and created a conservation program for the freshwater fish down there, which is the big, biggest stronghold of, for freshwater fish in the world. And those fish in the Amazon were facing many of the same threats that Pacific salmon were facing. So he did such a good job. The Rainforest Alliance tried to hire him and he said, no, no. And um, he took it all back to Yale and they did admit him. And uh, he had to take horrible math courses and science courses and his dyslexia was, um, a, you know, I, I think it, it, it made things very difficult for him, but, but he, he prevailed. And, um, and this marked a, a period in his life where he uh, decided really to um, fit in that he knew enough to know that to survive in a, any given environment, you needed to fit in. And so he 
went out and got the required uniform for this new world. There he is looking not terribly happy. But he was starting to grasp that he needed um, he needed to win over people to his to his vision and to his mission, and he was absolutely determined to do it. So he was starting to turn his powers of observation to the most complex species, human beings, and um, he started to study them and to learn how they behaved and especially the ones that he needed. Um, and what we saw that they weren't that different from salmon, you know, that they, some like the fast water, some like the still water, um, they ate different things. They were inspired by different things. And he resolved to find out um, what, you know, these individuals that he needed, you know, whether they be billionaires or scientists, um, what they, what they, what excited them and how he could possibly um, gain a toehold. Um, and uh, so he succeeded in this when he figured out who, who in positions of power and resource, who had people who, in power, who had tremendous resources, um, who also were fly fisher people. Um, because he had <clears throat> an incredible gift for taking someone into the river and bringing the river alive for them. He was like a portal into the wilderness. And you could go into the current with him and he would point out, you know, the bugs buzzing above the water and the shade this, this tree was throwing and this deep pool next right next to you where fish might be holding on their journey up upstream to spawn the temperature of the the air the humidity the time of day and you know the fallen log that was probably sheltering um you know juvenile fish and you know before you knew it the whole ecosystem Came alive for you and I had experienced this many times so I, I knew I understood exactly his charm and um, here he is with uh, Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor who he somehow connected with he was tireless in his efforts to get to these people um, who could help him and then to invite them fishing and this was um, really a brilliant strategy because as you guys know at headwaters there's nothing like a direct experience you know you can tell someone all about what it's like to stand in a wild salmon river but it doesn't compare to to being there so um and he was starting to um he was starting to uh understand that his job was going to involve um, the countries of the Pacific Rim and that to, to protect strongholds across the entire ecosystem, he would need the support and help of Canada, Russia, Japan, the Koreas. And um, the biggest challenge from the beginning uh, was Russia. So in the early 90s, when the Soviet Union collapsed, um, it was a very exciting moment for fly fishermen because there had been tales of this distant land um, in the Russian Far East and the massive fish that lived there. So Guido was very anxious to go. And he was the first fly fisherman uh, to catch all six species on a fly over there in Russia. So. Um, so it soon became clear that a massive number, massive percentage of wild salmon lived over here in the Russian Far East, particularly on this peninsula of Kamchatka. Now this peninsula is the size of California. It's big and it's full of incredible salmon rivers. So this was his target. 
And sure enough, he found Sam in Paradise. And Kamchatka is, it's a remarkable place um, for the strange reason that it was a military closed zone for decades because it was the um, it was the base for the Soviet nuclear submarine fleet. And so nobody went there. And there were like two roads that went nowhere. And <clears throat> uh, these rivers were virtually untouched. Vito described it as like going back in time, back to the Pleistocene era. And there were, you know, something like 20 active volcanoes and incredible amounts of wildlife <clears throat> and these rivers like you've never seen. This is how you get around in Kamchatka um, by helicopter. And it's, it's, it's an interesting part of the world. Such abundance of fish. And as I said, rivers like we've never seen. Now this river is a, an untouched salmon river, a floodplain salmon river. And um, you can hardly see the end of it. So in the West, we lost our, <clears throat> our um, natural salmon rivers when the settlers came and planted uh, crops and um, really like narrowed these multi-channel rivers down into one channel. And, and that's a <clears throat> kind of how we think of a river is this, a single channel. But really these rivers are systems and they are dynamic and changing. And the river has its own character. Um, and it is full of salmon habitat because when it changes course, it will knock over trees and those trees will create log jams and um, all this like still water and habitat for little fish to, um, to grow up in really. And so, so rich in fish. And, and he couldn't believe that he was seeing six species in one river. And in the West, that's just really rare. And that all these six species were cohabitating because um, the ecosystem was so, the habitats were so rich and varied that all, all fish, all the species could survive there. So, so um, yeah, the challenge with Russia was, um, of course, geopolitical, but, um, and this makes me think of Headwaters too, because the alliance that Guido's organization, the Wild Salmon Center forged was with the scientists in Russia who were very interested in salmon and Russia in general is very, very interested in science. And um, this is a photo of one of the camps that Guido was in with um, a, both American and Russian scientists where they were collecting data and sharing data. The, the Western scientists had very sophisticated sort of DNA analysis um, technology and uh, the Russians had been watching these rivers and doing their own form of science morphology, which is, you know, you kill the fish and then you analyze its, its odalis bone, this bone in the brain that can show you, you know, what the fish has been up to, where it travels, um, when it travels. And they just kind of got together and formed this like brain trust that provided an incredible amount of data for, Westerners particularly to um, approach conservation because it's hard to protect species you don't fully understand. And in the West, we don't have perfect salmon rivers really anymore. Um, very few um, up in Alaska and in British Columbia, but they're a rare thing. So, um, so these, uh, there's Guido on the left with his group of, um, scientists 
and they got together and they wrote papers that uh, rocked the world, you know, and um, they have a partnership that exists today and research, ongoing research, um, you know, with with the salmon there, um, clipping, um, scaling and, and tagging fish so they can monitor uh, what's actually happening in a healthy, healthy um, salmon river. So one, one thing they found, um, so we, a steelhead is, uh, the name of a, a trout that goes to the ocean and it changes dramatically. And some would say that it actually becomes a salmon. Um, and so it's a big mystery why some trout go to the ocean and some don't. And why some steelhead um, produce trout, they produce steelhead. It's all kind of like, it seems um, sort of like a puzzle, sort of like this species is sort of evolving as we're watching it, you know, like it's starting to change, like trout are starting to change their behavior in search of more food. Um, in Russia, what they found was they found, so if we had two life histories of steelhead, either a trout stays in the river or it goes to the ocean, they had 19 life histories of steelhead, which they analyzed uh, through, through their otolith bones, where they could see that the fish had gone down to the estuary and hung out and then come back, had sort of changed, but not really. Or they had gone out to sea and stayed close to the coast, or they had gone way out and stayed a long time. There were examples of steelhead who were repeat spawners, um, which was kind of unheard of. But this was just fascinating because it showed what could happen um, in an undisturbed habitat, you know, and instead of struggling to survive, these fish were actually evolving and expanding. Um, their capabilities. Yeah, and there's the, uh, they had these, uh, set up these incredible science tents um, in the middle of the tundra, imagine. So <clears throat> there was a, always a sense of urgency um, with this endeavor of, of Guido's and this map, uh, can show you why. So this is a map of human population density. And you see over here in California, you would think, oh, we're, we'd be super red and maxed out uh, people-wise, but really it's nothing compared to what's happening over here in Asia, where they're literally, you know, living vertically, um, building up into the sky. Uh, so many people, and um, they've, pretty much lost their natural resources. So there's great pressure to develop this untouched area here, which is full of natural gas and oil and different ores, you know, gold, silver, copper. There, there's timber, there's fish, and um, it's all kind of for sale. You know, it's kind of up for grabs. So Guido had, pressed really hard to um, convince the Russians to protect, you know, portions of this, this, this very biodiverse and rich region. Um, and it was tough, but part of the argument that persuaded the Russians was that extractive, extractive industries like mining or natural gas or drilling for oil, extractive meaning or timber, you take things away from the earth. Um, they all had a timeline on them and they were all pretty injurious to the land. They left big messes and um, destroyed habitat completely. Whereas the salmon ecosystem was regenerative and um, nourished, you know, so much more than you know any person could possibly understand but that that protecting the the resource of salmon was 
as valuable, if not more valuable than the money they could make on these um, really this, these just very destructive, um, extractive uh, practices. And they slowly came around and um, he spent many, many, many moons over there talking to local, district, regional, federal um, officials uh, who didn't really even understand the concept of conservation. And um, that's changed completely. And Russia and America are now very much in step with conserving um, Pacific salmon, which is fantastic. Yeah, you can see the danger here of, of these are plans for projected pipelines and oil and gas structures. Um, it's a little bit frightening. So these pipelines require roads to be built along the coast here, um, across the mouths of all these salmon rivers. And one of the problems with that is that um, poaching is a really big problem in Russia. So when the Soviet Union collapsed, the Soviet system, which did a lot for people, you know, they had a real infrastructure, they had food and, and they, they had fisheries and they had pretty much everything they needed in terms of electricity and just, you know, everything you need to live. And, and that system was pulled like a plug when the Soviet Union collapsed. So these people out in the Russian Far East are really leading subsistence level lives. And so it's kind of a lawless place because um, everyone's out for themselves. And um, there's a great demand on the black market for salmon roe. And this is a terrible practice um, with kind of mafia backed and you know these armored personnel carriers go in um, to the untrammeled wilderness and set up poaching camps and um, will string a net across a river uh, bank to bank during migration time and they'll just pluck the fish out of the river, gut them and throw them on the banks. And this is a painful photograph, but um, this is uh, the ignorance, you know, think of the, think of the, the richness we have here, the males and females suffocating together um, on the shore. Um, but because of Guido's efforts in the Wild Salmon Center, um, the locals have become uh, aware of these abuses and have formed their own anti-poaching brigades um, because salmon are such um, an iconic species for them over there and they see that the numbers are going down you know even in Russia so they've started to fight for their fish and they've started educational programs in the schools and started they've started to teach people what a salmon does in its lifetime you know how it migrates and and none of this was really known so Yes, there's some there are some grim realities over there in Russia, but um, incredible successes in terms of raising consciousness. And um, and here is the good news. So Guido's strongholds um, across the Pacific Rim, and this is what the Wild Salmon Center has managed to protect. And I think even this day, this map has been updated. Um, but you'll see that, uh, you know, these vast, vast protected areas have kind of formed this, um, you know, a network for these fish to survive. And we want them to survive. <laughs> um, so that is a little bit about, um, you know, what this book gets into, um, but I wanted to read a, a short section to give you a feeling for the, um, the style of the book, because while there is a lot of conservation and, and geopolitics and ichthyology wrapped in, it's a very accessible book. And as Andy and I were saying in the beginning, it, it was my um, 
intention to write a book that uh, appealed to just everybody um, because it was a book about people and family and um, the interaction and the interconnectedness between humans and um, ecosystems. So, so I'm going to read the introduction to Stronghold. And it starts in Russia. Camp Chatka, Russia, 1999. The MI8 was packed beyond all reasonable capacity. 32 passengers, two Zodiacs with outboard jet engines, three whitewater rafts, six wall tents, scientific equipment, rods, food, and miscellaneous gear filled the chopper from floor to ceiling. The only way back to civilization was over the Serendini mountain range, whose peaks rose to more than 11,000 feet. The pilot tapped his watch to urge one last passenger on board, but Guido Ra refused. Inside the helicopter, the group was getting restless. Their fuel was limited and the weather was shifting. What was the holdup? The men conferred loudly over the thrum of the whirling rotor. What was going on? In bush flying, it said that if you can get the doors of a helicopter closed, it will fly. The MI-8 had two powerful turbine engines and was built for the toughest conditions. But with the weight of the gear and a section of heavy oil drilling pipe, the chopper's wheels had sunk into the soft meadow soil and the fuselage was resting on the ground. The battered old helicopter with its oil streaked hull looked too much like a death trap. Guido turned away from the distressing sight <clears throat> to study the weather. The gathering of low clouds forced his decision. He marched resolutely to the helicopter and squeezed himself in with the others. It would be a tragedy for the group and their invaluable data to perish on the return trip. But what choice did they have? The doors closed, barely. The passengers sat grimly along the sides of the fuselage, trapped by the mountain of gear around them. Among them were elite fly fishermen, some of Russia's and America's top scientists. Together, they had explored one of Russia's many untouched salmon rivers on the peninsula of Kamchatka. Somewhere in the chopper, sprigs of vegetation and river water floated in tubes, and canisters of liquid nitrogen preserved fish scales and fin clippings. Packed away in waterproof bags were notebooks that held sketches and topographical measurements. Together, these gathered bits described an immense ecosystem. Americans hadn't known existed. It was an ecosystem based on salmon. If they made it home, the team of scientists could help to change the way people saw salmon and their rivers forever. The difficulty was in reaching this remote region and in getting back home again. Vito settled himself among his companions. Turning at full throttle, the turbine could barely lift them. It groaned and trembled before heaving itself upward, then rose slowly above the forest sending leaves and branches whirling. The pilot dropped the nose of the chopper and headed south, flying so low over the forest that the branches seemed to brush the bottom of the craft. They stayed low for a hundred miles, flying over the Kolpakova, Verovskaya, and Kol rivers. Through the windows, the passengers could glimpse a vast landscape of forests, rivers, and mountains. The Sea of Volkokots glittered to the west, to the east were mountain slopes dusted with the first snow of winter. Below were hills blanketed in the gold and orange mosaic of stone, stone birch and river valleys marked by still green bands of cottonwood and alder. Guido had a view of the cockpit. The pilot was on the left, the navigator on the right, and the mechanic in the middle. It boded well that all three had some gray hair and likely were veteran pilot, Russian pilots who had fought in the Afghan war. The pilot was looking for a break in the peaks. Guido watched his stoic face in half profile as he decided on a route and headed straight toward the base of the mountain range. As the land began to rise, the pilot held his course. The choppers seemed ready to kiss the earth when the air pressure from the blades meeting the ground pushed it aloft. A few hundred yards later, they were heading straight back into the mountain again, this time barely missing a copse of pines. 
No one spoke as they stair-stepped up the mountain. Each passenger was sealed in his own isolation. Not all of them could see what was happening, but they could feel it. The chopper was hopping lamely from forest to tundra to snowpack. As they climbed higher, the engines labored in the thinning air. Guido watched through the cockpit as the volcanic ridge above them approached. The vegetation below had given away to rock, snow, and ice. When they broke through the clouds, Guido got a partial view of two jagged rocky peaks with a slight dip in between, defined by a long ridge of wind-blown snow. <clears throat> the final precipice rose before them like a wall. At the top of the ridge was a thin cornice of snow, as sharp as a razor. The helicopter throbbed and whined as it reached the summit. Then they were through. The other side of the mountain gave way to a thousand feet of vertical cliff. When the ground beneath them disappeared, the helicopter tipped over the cornice and fell. As the MI-8 rolled slightly to the left, the cargo began to slide. One of the American passengers stood up and yelled, oh shit, and was immediately restrained by a Russian next to him. Any further destabilization could put them into a roll. As the helicopter fell, its roar and groan were replaced by silence. The men felt weightless as the rotors thumped against the gravity of their descent. Long seconds passed as the blade slowly caught purchase in the thin air and stabilized the chopper. Gradually, it moved forward as well as down, arcing out across the mountain range into the broad valley of the Kamchatka River and the city of Petropavlovsk beyond. Guido strained to see the rivers below. He recognized these transporters of fish as living organisms now and wanted to observe the idiosyncrasies of their design, where their flow was pinched by canyons, where they curved back on themselves and where they spread across the plains like light. Of the many trips to Russia that followed, some would be to Moscow to do battle behind the walls of the Kremlin. His battle would hurdle him into the one of the most formidable complicated and unpredictable countries in the world. To protect these perfect rivers, he needed knowledge, money, and power, and he needed them in Russia. Over the next 20 years and 25 expeditions, Guido would harness the power of oligarchs and billionaires on two continents to protect vast swaths of pristine wilderness and do more than any man alive to make the United States and Russia realize they were joint custodians of a massive watershed ecosystem held in place by salmon. It was the salmon that had brought Guido to the fight. He had chased them for most of his life and seemed to take instruction from their wildness, their resilience, <clears throat> and their unwavering purpose. Perhaps the salmon with their epic migrations and unflagging determination to live inspired him to choose a course that even those closest to him could sometimes not believe. It had all started long ago on the other end of the Pacific Rim with a wayward tow-headed boy and his fishing rod on a river in Oregon, a boy who from the start was uncommon. Tucker, thank you so much. That was lovely. You're welcome. Yeah, uh, you've given us a, an enormous amount of your time. Can mm -hmm. we? ask you some questions? Absolutely. Right. Um, I guess before I jump into a question, I just wanna say, uh, folks, whether you're picking this up live or you're checking in on us uh, at your own convenience, we really appreciate you listening. And please put your questions in, uh, in the common field and we'll uh, get some answers to your questions. Um, I have a million questions. I love this book. So uh, I think if you found whether it's the human stories, or the science story, the salmon aspect, you're an at, you're an angler. It doesn't matter. There are, there are about 15 different ways into the story, and mm -hmm. and that, that introduction didn't hook you. Then I don't I don't know what you're doing. So uh, <laughs> please find it within yourself to to check this book out. Um, Tucker, I want to ask some lesson questions as we wait for a few things to roll in, um, and maybe we'll hit some of the sciencey stuff a little bit later. But I'm I'm curious. As an educator, I look at Guido's story and, and I wanna know what our educational systems should be learning 
from this experience? Like, how do we, how do we improve? How do we serve people like this who have so much to give, but need a different uh, way in? Mm. I mean, that's a great question. And I mean, luckily we're so much more aware of learning differences now. Um, and I mean, programs like yours go a long way to switching on the light for kids because in terms of learning, I think that's what it comes down to. Um, I mean, I remember when I got turned on to learning, I wasn't, I don't know if I was a born student really, but at one point my learning became more active and um, less passive, less just being told things. And and I see with my son, he's he's there's a lot of passive learning um, and it doesn't engage like active learning, like dialogue, like getting out into the field, like seeing things for yourself. So, I mean, in terms of what you guys are doing, you're right on target as far as I'm concerned, getting kids to get out and look at things themselves and, and observe firsthand how our beautiful world works. Thanks. Yeah, it, you can't really be getting uh, dirt under the fingernails. Something mm -hmm. I, I've always believed. We've got a science question coming in from Spencer Usden, one of our instructors. Um, and he asked, the proposed Pebble Bay mine in Bristol Bay was in the news recently. Do you have thoughts on the conservation efforts there and what has allowed those efforts to be successful in preventing development of that area? Um, I actually know a lot about that story. Um, I thanks Spencer. Um, so this has been Guido's um, mission for years now. And in fact, there um, would have been, could have been an entire other book only on Pebble Mine. Um, I cover it briefly in Stronghold because it was just too much um, for the narrative to handle. But yes, um, Gita's been working tirelessly. Um, and here's a fun little story. So Stronghold made its way into the White House um, the, in the last couple of months. And it actually swayed some key people. Um, to see the senselessness of this mine, this copper mine that had been basically um, deep sixed under Obama because of just unbelievable consequences to the Clean Water Act um, and <clears throat> devastating consequences to this massive stronghold that is home to something like 60 million sockeye fish and our greatest stronghold in North America. So, you know, this copper mine, it's worth a lot of money, but, um, you know, it's, it's really sort of the debate of our, of our time, you know, this, this uh, extractive industry against the regenerative um, health of a, a, a salmon ecosystem. And, um, you know, of course it got, it got green lighted as soon as Trump came into office and nobody could believe it because they've done all this work to educate people on why this copper mine, copper is a neurotoxin for salmon and they were gonna dig this open pit mine as deep as the Grand Canyon and two miles long and with tailings that would have to be covered in perpetuity, otherwise they would become unbelievably toxic to everything in the environment and you know the mining industry they're famous for being really irresponsible in this way and it's like oh no the fish will be fine nothing's gonna happen and they just you know they want to get in and out um so and uh, northern dynasty the canadian company that um owns the the rights to drilling this mine and they've been looking for partners and failing because even other mining companies who are unscrupulous and, and you know, eyes on the bottom line, they're like, no, 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 this does not look good. But just this week, the stock value, Guido sent me a, a little graphic of the, the stock value of Northern Dynasty and it went, diddly, oops, diddly, oops, diddly. <laughs> you know, it just dropped out. So, you know, fingers crossed that this, this thing has gotten the kibosh for good. Yeah, yeah. Is there an experiential, you sort of talked about the the component, whether it was in building the board and the, the people that Guido was meeting and able to cultivate through 
giving them an experience or convincing um, folks in Kamchatka through experience that there's more value in in recreation and conservation than there is an extraction. Was there an experiential component to this Pebble Bay story? Pebble Mine story in Bristol Bay, sorry. You mean in terms of um, in terms of him recruiting people to help him or? Yeah, well, in terms of sort of turning the tide at, at, as it seems to have happened recently. Right, well, he's been taking people up there um, He's got sort of an, uh, an ace up his sleeve. He's got a, uh, a, a Republican um, donor and fan and conservationist. I mean, this is the thing about the environment is that it, it is, but it, it's, it's nonpartisan. You know, Republicans were once the great protectors of, of our natural resources and now it's become sort of a democratic issue and it's not, you know, it's it's not accurate. It's not an accurate representation of how people feel in the country. So um, Guido has some, uh, you know, he doesn't care who it is that helps him and he doesn't judge people, you know, he kind of sees them. And, and this, I think, is so healthy and instructive. You know, he sees people like creatures and animals and fish, you know, you develop in response to your environment. And um, you, no one's, I mean, certainly people are guilty of some things, but in general, you know, our, our opinions and how we see things, we've been formed by what we've been, you know, surrounded by. So in any case, he's um, made a point of taking people to um, this this Republican donor has a lodge, a, 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 an amazing lodge up there in Bristol Bay, and, and he will take donors up there and potential supporters up to Bristol Bay and fish in these waters and watch these fish coming in from the ocean, you know, millions of them, crimson red, you know, um, it's just something to behold. I, I've, I've been up there a few times myself and it is just, it's life changing. It really is. It's just, oh my God. Yeah, that's great. Um... Uh, let's see what we should pick here. I wonder, um, if, since we're talking about sort of this plat, this the plat, this idea of plasticity, kind of this idea that there is, um, we're a product a little bit of our environment and how we change. And there's all these metaphors here when you're talking about steelhead, and we're talking about Guido and his capacity to change and evolve to meet to meet his goals. Mm -hmm. um, if there are, there is a lesson for all of us in this time where we're sort of living in an empathy empathy deficit, mm -hmm. uh, like what what should I learn from Salmon? Like what should I learn from Guido? What should I learn from Salmon? How, like how I navigate this world? Um, and yeah. Try to build alliances or try to build a coalition of people who care about things that matter. Yeah, I mean, what a question, right? Because that's what we all need to be thinking about. Um, I, we live in a time of, of real division and judgment. And I think that, um, you know, lowering down those pre, those boundaries, those preconceptions are, are really important. Um, almost nothing is personal, you know? And to look at something with some, with look at people like you look at um, the environment, look at an ecosystem, you look at it, a, look at them objectively and, and see what's influencing them and see, try to find the common ground where you can meet and ask questions, you know, be curious and investigate. And instead of forming your own opinions, just listen and pay attention and look for the way in because that's the magic stuff. You know, we need to be building bridges, um, not walls, we've got more than enough of those. But I think that, um, you know, engaging um, on an emotional level is not a bad thing, right? People respond, well, people are essentially good and they essentially want to connect and they want to form community, they want to agree, they want to get along. And so it's tricky times now, but it's also, there's also so much opportunity to, to, to have these conversations. Yes find some common ground, start mm -hmm. there and just yeah. be open. Yeah. Take people to a salmon river, you know, <laughs> people, nature is a great equalizer. Yeah, absolutely. Share your, share your passion and see who comes along for the ride. 
Yeah, exactly. How do you feel about one more science question and one more human human nature question? Sure. All right, let's do the science question first. Uh, you talked a lot about genetic diversity, this idea of like we, we don't quite know why salmon find their way back to their streams. I'm gonna use some science vocab here. Like we, we don't understand the nature of their their philopatry, why they go home. Um, mm -hmm. but we know it's important. Despite that, um, as populations fluctuate and crash, uh, augmentation through hatchery, uh, whether it's hatchery trout, hatchery salmon, depending on the system, is something that we've used in the past and we keep talking about. Um, you address this local adaptation idea really well in your book, and I wonder if you wouldn't mind taking a minute to address it here. Sure. Um, yeah, hatcheries seem like a really good solution for um, a scarcity of fish and uh, why why wouldn't that work? Um, so the answer is that hatcheries will take well, a few select healthy individual salmon, trout, and then they will clone them millions of times. So, and then they will release them into the um, river and so imagine this, imagine uh, wherever you live and um, a million, or I don't know what the proportion would be to your town, your city, but imagine, you know, a million clones are dropped into the Bay Area and those clones are competing for the same resources that you are. And they're also starting to intermarry and um, you can see how the genetic intelligence of a population might be compromised if you had one million of the exact same genetic code. So the same goes for fish and salmon have these incredible genetic codes within them that allow them to find their first rivers. Um, the fish near our cabin in Oregon up the seasonal creek, Eagle Creek. A seasonal creek dries up in the summer. And so the steelhead that live there have to time their uh, journeys, their spawning journeys very precisely. So the female salmon, they have to, they have to leave the ocean when the eggs inside of them are pretty small because if they have too much weight, they can't make it up these waterfalls at the, at the bottom of the Deschutes River. And so they have to come a little bit early and then they hang out at the base of the creek and while their eggs gestate. And then they wait for the rains to build the water up enough for them to go. Um, and they don't wanna go too late because then there's a danger that the minnows, um, that they will end up, that they will have, the, the, the eggs that will turn into minnows will dry up in the creek and not make it back to the river. So it's all these different considerations. It's like, you know, notches on a key that fit a lock. And, you know, what happens when you introduce um, a genetic kind of zero into that system? Well, it dilutes that intelligence. And hatchery fish, you know, they don't have homes. They don't know, they go back to a hatchery and they don't go back and feed the environment. Um, they go back to these steel bins or they wander into other systems. Um, in the Sacramento River, when they first started uh, um, producing Chinook sh hatchery fish, they, um, you know, they released hundreds of thousands, a million, I don't know, but they had really great success. And they're like, oh, we've solved the problem. You know, we're gonna have fish forever. And then I think it was like the third year, no fish came back, essentially no fish came back because they don't have the genetic diversity to deal with the different conditions in the ocean. So they'll be impacted exactly the same way, right? So it's like, if I as an individual have a propensity for some disease, you know, um, and there's 10 clones of me, well, they're probably all gonna get that same disease. So um, 
so it's another reason um, that hatcheries can be dangerous. Uh, a, a third reason is, um, you know, the Pacific Rim system is very interconnected and what hatcheries do in Japan affects us um, over here. And there was evidence of that um, when Guido's organization got these, the nations of the Pacific Rim together to talk about their practices with their fisheries and hatcheries and to really come forward with their, you know, what, all the stuff they were doing. And they had found in Alaska some um, Japanese pink salmon um, somehow, like young pink salmon. And no one really understood why until the Japanese fessed up to producing like so churning out so many hatchery fish that they had basically, you know, cleared out of that, um, out of their, their region basically, you know, which means that the ocean isn't a bo bottomless source of food, you know, there's, and, and that these populations in Japan, these hatchery populations affect what happens um, thousands of miles away. So it's, it's, complicated. Um, and nature, we were talking earlier, Andy, about how um, technology and science often think that they can outsmart nature, but I don't think so. You know, it's just been too long in the evolution and it's too complex and interwoven and beautiful and balanced and perfect. I mean, a, 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 healthy, a healthy ecosystem is something to behold. And I urge all of you to get out and see them while you can. <laughs> and it'll inspire you to protect them because they give something to you um, almost on a cellular, cellular level. Yeah, it's a, it's a feeling exactly. of belonging exactly. that one has. Uh, yeah, you walked me right into this ecosystem architecture question, but I'm gonna, okay. I'm gonna stick to the plan and ask the, a, a different sort of question, which for me is that I have students who are excellent at science excellent in English, uh, you know, in their humanities studies, and they want to tell stories. They want to tell stories about uh, the scientific phenomenon that they're passionate about, about advocacy, and about their generation moving forward. Mm -hmm. And do you have advice for mm -hmm. graduating high schoolers, um, on the way up, young adults who want to be able to swim in both pools really effectively and maybe remove some of that nomenclature, that separation between mm -hmm. humanities and STEM? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, great question and great ambition. I think that um, you know, human beings are a good way into an ecosystem because if you're just reading about ecosystems and science, chances are the people that are going to be buying those books are conservationists, scientists, and you know, it's a bit bit of the preaching to the choir. <laughs> But to tell a story that involves a um, person, a community um, that can, you know, really um, crack open the natural world for someone and allow them to see all the connections and that there aren't these separations, that, that we really are so closely intertwined. Um, so it's really finding that human connection or just writing from your heart about how these systems and creatures impact you and, and how you experience them. And um, inviting people into that world because it's a world that we share, but fewer and fewer, fewer of us are getting access to it and appreciating it. And, and so, you know, the protection becomes precarious when people aren't loving it. So spreading the love, you know, in any way you can. And, you know, if you have to trick them into reading a story about a person. <laughs> I didn't put it like that. <laughs> yeah, all's fair. <laughs> Absolutely. As the, as the spaces that can have that impact on you shrink, the desire to be in those spaces is growing yeah. exponentially. And it's just important to, to grow our educational outreach right try to have people understand um well thank you tucker malarkey it's been a pleasure thank Lovely. you so much thank you folks out there thank you for tuning in if you have questions 
throw them in the comments. We'll get them. We'll get them to Tucker. And thank you for following along with our uh, with our women in science speakers series.